of D8 Live. Our next guest is uh, from RTE, which... Uh, uh, <laughs> said, steady, steady. He hasn't spoken yet, and you can't, you can't boo him until at least he's spoken. He also happens to be the owner slash operator slash person behind the biggest book club in Ireland. Apart from that, he is a, 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 a representative and an ambassador uh, for Epilepsy Ireland. Um, so he's got a lot of strings to, to his bow. Not least of which, he's a local boy. He's from Drimna, just up the road. So please put your hands together for Mick O'Shea. Did you get that right or wrong? Yeah, yeah. Did it? Steady, steady. I don't run the joint, I just work there. Okay, so deep, before we go any further, deep breaths. Steady, deep steady. steady. Right. Ooh, I, I've been intimidated. I've been intimidated several times already tonight, you know. Uh, but when I'm beside an RTE broadcaster, I feel I'm doing everything wrong. And here's the thing. I'm normally used to being the person who's doing the interviewing. So this is very... I'm not in control. I don't like this at all. This is weird. <laughs> so this is... Normally, any time I'm here, and, and I'm, I'm here possibly slightly too regularly. I'm here either for the table quizzes in this room, or I'm sitting somewhere over in a snug in the, in the other hand, somewhere on a night when there's no one knocking around. I've never stood up and said things to people in front of anybody in this pub, so hello. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> so, a local boy, you went to Drimna Castle. I did. Uh, when I think of you, I think of a guy who is very much into his reading, and um, when I think of everybody else I know in Drimna, I think of people who don't do a lot of reading but kick a lot of football. So, what happened to you? What a hideous slur on people from Drimna. Go way out for that. Um, it's, it's, it's not really a long story. It's kind of a short enough one. Um, I, for anybody who knows David House uh, on Galtzmore Road, I, I grew up in David House. Both my sets of grandparents were living on two of the balconies opposite to each other, and that's how my mum and dad met in a very weirdly anti-Romeo and Juliet kind of way. They were on opposite balconies in David House. Love across the balconies. Um, Sort of, although as they ended up there, as, as lots of people did, my mum is originally from the Liberties. My mum grew up in a tenement just off Cambrassel Street uh, and was one of the last families to be moved out in the late 1950s. They were still moving people out at that stage. So just when they were building the, the wide part of Cambrassel Street as you come down to the very end of it, they were moved out. They were moved out to the suburbs and moved out to a little maisonette, as they called it in those days, in uh, Damon House. And my dad's family came from Offaly and they ended up on opposite sides of the same balcony. My grandmother worked in the fur trade at one point when that was still an acceptable legal thing for people to do in the 40s and 50s. Uh, and my granddad used to be, if he ever went to the fruit and veg market in town, at any stage in the kind of 60s or 70s into the 1980s, and you parked your car in the fruit and veg market, and my granddad was the guy who did the little thing, rolled the tickets and gave you your ticket, and took the money off you to park in the fruit and veg market. Wow. So that's that's the, the family. And on the other side, my granddad was a, was a scaffolding. But, but I haven't answered your have question. To, no, I haven't answered have, your question at all. It doesn't help nope. us understand how you end up this uh, guy with his nose in a book all the time, who's going to tell us in a few minutes about how he set out to was it read a hundred books in one year? Yeah. And you did it. How, yeah. how did I? I was terrible at every kind of sport. I was and I didn't. I went to Drimna Castle, Drimna Castle at that stage had a very good uh, gay football team. They were kind of all right at hurling. You weren't allowed to play soccer. That was still illegal in the nineteen eighties. You weren't allowed to that. I was terrible. I liked it. It was good fun. We kicked around at lunchtime, but like I was never going to make it onto any of the teams. And I was a little pudgy barrel of a kid, and I sort of still am. Uh, so I oh, had no, you're not. That's... <laughs> Jerry, it is way too early for Pantos. <laughs> it is way too early for that. Um, so, so I had other things I was interested in. I was a nerdy kid. I played computer games, uh, very early primitive computer games. And I read a lot. I was in primary school. Uh, and I'd already been reading Famous Five, Secret Seven, Enid Blight and stuff, Hardy Boys, Three Investigators. Woo! <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Was, was that for the Hardy? Was that for the Hardy Boys or Enid Blight? <laughs> Enid Blight? That was for the Famous oh, Five. Oh, just for the Famous Five. <laughs> Don't you'll you get lost? Yes. Okay, fine. Um, so yeah, I did all that, and I ended up in uh, one of my classes in primary school, and we were in prefabs in those days because there were too many kids in all of classrooms. I make it sound like I'm in the Oliver Twist, but at the, at the back of the room, they had a tiny, tiny little library, and I picked out a book of short stories by a man called Arthur C. Clarke. Anybody knows of science fiction? You know who Arthur C. Clarke is, wrote 2001 A Space Odyssey, and that was the first 
adult book I picked up, book not written for kids, and I started laying into science fiction, comic books, everything I could get my hands on. And I was a kind of nerdy, introverted, no good at sport kid, and just, I still am. <laughs> oh, no, you're not. <laughs> oh, yes, I am. So, how did the career in broadcasting come about? By accident. Fell into it. Not a clue. Thanks for asking. I, um, I entered a radio competition when I was 15. Um, not because I listened to radio very much. Not because I liked music very much. I kind of did. Um, does anybody remember, again, God, there's going to be a lot of this. Does anybody remember Sunshine 101? Not the one that exists now, yeah. but the one in the late 1980s, the pirate station. Um, from Port Marnock. From Port Marnock. There you go. So they broadcast from the back of the Sands Hotel in Port Marnock, out there. And in 88, they ran a DJ competition for new DJs. And they took in anybody. And I was 15. And I got as far as the final, and I lost, thank God, because the prize was 50,000 old pounds worth of stuff that obviously they'd gotten from sponsors. You know, you got, my favorite one was, one of them was the rental of a speedboat for a year. <laughs> like, which, coming down from Drimna, in no, no, we, <laughs> Worse, we lived in Bangor Road in Crumlin. That's even further away from the canal. You couldn't even get your speedboat there if we'd had a speedboat for a year. So I lost. But I met a couple of people who were kind of nice, and one of them, when I was doing one of the competition bits on the radio, said, oh, would you ever think of doing this? And something, somewhere, stuck. <laughs> so the year between school and college, I went over to St. James's Hospital, but back when they used to have a uh, hospital radio, radio station, station. It, it didn't exist for much longer after I was there, I ruined it. <laughs> um, but they used to have a hospital radio station, not on FM, on speakers, all the way around the hospital, which everybody had turned off right. all of the time. <laughs> But as a kid learning how to do radio, that's brilliant. No one is listening to you. No one's going to correct you. No one is going to say, what's that young lad doing there? Right. So I ended up doing that, and I walked into UCD. The first day I was going into UCD, and they were setting up a student radio station as well. And I wandered in, and I was the only person who had any experience. I had six weeks experience in a hospital radio station, and that was that made me the most experienced member of staff. Did a bit of local radio. Did a bit of Atlantic 252, for those people who remember that. I fell into... Thank you. I fell into that for about a year and a half in the mid 90s, and then I worked in FM 104, and I have, for my grand sins, been in RTE for 22 years this year. Wow. And speaking, I've got less for murder. Speaking of RTE, please. Um, just, what's it like? It's <laughs> a very, that's a very, a very loaded shrug of the shoulders. There. It's like, what's it like? Um, I, I just I, I hear a lot about it, you know? You do. I'm, I'm, I get a lot of people asking me that at the moment, more so than at any other time when I've been working there. Um, I'm a staff member, I'm a member of the NUJ, uh, I am very much with my union in terms of what the angle they have been taking with regards to everything that's happened in the last six months. Um, and it's still a very uncertain time for loads of people who work around me. It's that weird thing of finding out in, in the document that the Director General put out a couple of weeks ago that I work for RTE Gold. So for now, we've dodged a bullet, for now. Although a lot of other people who work in the digital radio stations around us haven't. And it's still really uncertain because there's this number that's been bandied about, about 400 uh, people out taking voluntary redundancy or retiring in those numbers. But as to how that happens, and as to who those people are, and as to how everything changes over the next five years, it's still all, for those of us who work there, a little bit on the vague side. So it's been weird working there for the last six months. Don't get me wrong, I've worked there for 22 years, we've always been in crisis. We've always been in crisis, we've always never had any money, we've always been, the, the, that's been the constant state. But at the moment, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird for, for people around me, and, and as to what happens, you know, None of us know. But there's a job vacancy there at the moment. It's, it's some presenting slot between about 9 and 10 in the morning, Monday to Friday. I'm just wondering, did you throw your CV in? The weird, here's the weird thing. I presented that show once. I did it two years ago today. And it was on the Monday after Ryan had done the Late Late Show Toy Show two years ago. And they were short of someone. Obviously, they went through the first 12 people and they all weren't available. <laughs> and I got a phone call just saying, would you be around on Monday morning to do it? And I was like, I think I can, yes, I can do that, no problem. 
Um, I went in, did it, and it was great. I had a great crack, and they never asked me back again, so obviously I wasn't particularly good at it. What about, is it Noel Kelly? Did you not get him to uh, represent I, you? I, I have no association with that gentleman whatsoever. He's, he's nothing to do with me. Because I think, would I be right in saying, he'd be pretty good at the job, wouldn't he? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's three votes. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, that's so lovely. That's, I'm going to go out here in a high tonight for the weekend. That's amazing. There were three people who went, oh, yeah, what? Are we clapping again? Okay. I'm going to try it again. I was just thinking Rick would be a really no, 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 good no, replacement it's for Ryan Chomsky. Totally. What do you think? It is so not counter. It doesn't mean anything because you had to be prompted. It doesn't mean anything. No, right. The thing is that we're, we're video recording this, and the great thing about it is that later on, Jenny's going to edit it, and she will decide either on putting oh, in the first that? one or the second one. Shot two. Is that a picture of number two? Okay, that's <laughs> great. Stuff. Thank you. Can I get a clip back from my socials? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we can do, do, it, do you want to do it a third time? No, no. no. <laughs> Let's not overrate the pudding. <laughs> uh, so, look, in, in answer to that question, uh, and again, I find it very hard to answer questions straight. Yeah, I, I don't know about, uh, about the night's 10 slot would be amazing. I'd love to do it. But, you know, either these things come to you or they don't. And I'm busy enough as it is with doing the six other things that I do aside from, from, from the daytime job. So, well, let's just talk about one or two of them. The book club. How did the Ricochet book club, the largest book club in Ireland, come about? There's a pattern here. By accident is the answer. And it's the answer to pretty much everything you're going to ask me tonight. I, um, I'd always read, I read voraciously from the time I was a kid, talked about that, and all the way up through my 20s and 30s, and I, I, I'd stalled. I was at a point kind of in my early 40s, mid-30s, where I was reading maybe about 10 or 12 books a year. I might read one book a month if I was doing really well. I might read one every six weeks if I was doing really well. And every time I'd go into bookshops, I'd have like a little anxiety attack. It would be that thing of looking at new books that have come out and going, I'd like to read that, I'd like to read that, I'd like to, if I'm alive for till I'm 80, I'm not going to read all of that. And then I thought, a conversation with my wife, and she was like, why don't you just do something about it and shut up, which is also something that frequently happens to my wife. I say something, she goes, do something about it and shut up. So I did. And I did the stupid thing, which at the time was, I thought, I could read 100 books in a year. It's two books a week. If I really put my mind to it, and I cut out a load of stuff I don't really care about, and I watched less television, and I read on the bus, and I read when I was on public transport, and did all of that. Uh, and But I know I had to keep myself honest. So uh, I said it on social media in front of everybody I knew. So therefore, when I, when as would happen in the middle of the year, I go, this is too hard, I can't do it, I would realize that everybody who knew me would realize I had failed. And I would go, no, I'm not going to do that in front of everyone I know. So I did it, it was 2014, I think, 2014. And I read 100 books in 2014. Um, and it's the best thing that ever happened to me because not only did I read a bunch of great books that year I never would have read, but then people on socials would ask things like, would you never think about starting a book club? And I'd go, oh, sit in a room full of people talking about books. No, go away, don't be silly. Does anybody hear of a book club, real life book club? Do you read any books? Yeah. Really? You're serious about it? Oh, fantastic. We're in the same book club. Oh, you're in the same book? So we might be the only one that's serious tonight. Oh, it's a... They also drink a lot of wine, though. Well, that's... What are you reading at the moment? What's the, what's the current one? The next person hasn't been to one yet. Okay, what was the last one? Oh my god, what was the last one? Seriously. How much wine is consumed at the book club? I mean, great. Why, why don't we come back to that in 10 minutes? You can raise your hand and then you can tell me what. Check in the WhatsApp. That's a great woman is a great title for a book. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Hang on, right. So I thought, hang on, I might do it online instead. So I'll set up a Facebook group, which seemed like the really smart way to do it at the time. I thought, you know, three or four hundred people maybe eventually, and we'll all talk about books, so it'll be great. That was 2014. And uh, nine years ago, there are 40,000 people in the group now, about 100 countries around the world, almost all of them in Ireland, but then you've got expats in the UK and people in America and Australia and pretty much everywhere. And so, it's so the nicest just... place on the internet because I don't allow anybody to be nasty to anybody else. I run it like a dictatorship with an iron fist. A nice iron fist and a glove. Well, glove. I was on it and I got kicked Here off. Here we go. Here we go. I knew this was going to come up. I've nothing else to say on that particular issue. Why, why, Jerry? Why did you get kicked out? Why, why did you get kicked out, Jerry? What was I, that about? I, 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 I brought out a book a couple of years ago, a wonderful novel set here in Dublin 8, and I just felt that the people in Ricochet's book club needed to hear about it. 
Well, apparently one of the rules, when you join the book club, you sign up, and more or less it says, thou shalt not plug one's own book. Oh. And Apart I, from once a month when we do a thing where we let everybody plug their books. I think, I don't know about this, because there are other admins that do it, so obviously you were kicked out by somebody other than me. I can't apologise because I didn't you, do it. Your minions, is it? Yeah, my other friends. <laughs> however, uh, however, yeah, that's probably what happened. You probably just talked about it too much. Sorry about that. Yeah. But yeah, you don't hold grudges, which is nice. <laughs> I like that bit. I, 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 Unless this is a whole ruse to bring me up. Here, so <laughs> really well, I just, I just think about all those people all over the world in Australia, New Zealand, all these people yeah. who tune you up. And I just think that their lives aren't quite as fulfilling as they could be. That's an interesting thought. <laughs> Not interesting enough, obviously. <laughs> I read it, it was good. <laughs> Thank you very much, Billy. We, we have two people here who read it, you know. But anyway, I, do, do you know what the last book was? Are you still in the WhatsApp group? <laughs> <laughs> You're still choking. <laughs> Where are we? Sorry. Where are we? Where, Where are we? Are we? Um, we? We have a couple of other topics. To, to, three, I can think of three anyway. One is to do with epilepsy, mm. and just explain to us your own personal experience in that area and, and the work you're doing in that area. Yeah, uh, I was sitting at home in the Christmas of the year, I turned 16, so 89, and uh, we were in the front room, I was sitting next to the Christmas tree, I have one brother, he's a couple of years younger than me, we were playing some sort of board game, and my mother reliably tells me that I stood up took a weird look on my face and fell over and took the Christmas tree with me. Her immediate reaction was, what is he doing? I was having a seizure. I had my first epileptic seizure when I was 16. And now, within five seconds, my mother went, oh no, hang on, something terrible has happened. Now, we can laugh about it now because I was only 16 at the time. It's a very long time ago and everything is fine. But nothing like that had ever happened in my family before. We had no history of it. We didn't know anybody who had epilepsy. Um, and I was taken by ambulance to St. James's and they sent me home essentially saying, look, you've had a seizure, but lots of people have seizures for various reasons, could be anything, and as long as it doesn't happen again, you're okay. And about three or four weeks later, it happened again. And then at that stage, they start bringing you in and doing tests and doing uh, EEGs and uh, eventually they said, yeah, look, odds are you have epilepsy. So I've had it since I was 16. Uh, I've been on medication ever since then. I'm stuck with that for the rest of my life. I take two pills in the morning and two pills at night. And in theory, if I do that, touch microphone, uh, I should be okay. Um, but it, it varies. Like there were times in my teenage years where I'd have them on and off. There were times when I went for five or six years in my early twenties where I didn't have one at all. And then I started having them again about once every eighteen months. Uh, and my last one was. 13 years ago now. I was put on a new medication that just came out 13 years ago, and it seems to have been a bit of a magic bullet that comes in now. So, again... And did it phone. impact your life in terms of, for example, were you allowed to drive a car? Could you get insurance? Um, did you... Did it provide a nasty environment for you getting slagged off when you were young or anything like that? It's weird. So there's two parts to that question. So when I was growing up in school, you think it would. But it didn't. I had a nice knot of mates, and they were very cool about it, and they were like, okay, what can we do? School were very good about it. They, my parents came in, and they'd been in contact with Epilepsy Ireland. They have, these days, they have whole packs of stuff that they can send out to schools, so that schools will know best practice, and will know how to get somebody through that first early part of it. Because psychologically, you're a 16-year-old kid, you've just realized you're gonna be stuck with something for the rest of your life that's going to affect almost everything you do and that at any stage like right here right now having a conversation with you i could go boom and i'll wake up with a crowd of people around me so it wasn't that bit wasn't that bad it was more thinking about the long-term consequences of it and yet the, the driving thing i started learning to drive when i was 17 i got my license in 2012. it took a while because you learn for a little while you drive for a little while you have a seizure it was initially two years you were off the road these days the, the law has been changed so it's you're off for a year now. But again, if I had a seizure at any point today, tomorrow, or whatever, I'm, I'm off the road for another 12 months. And that's, that just is what it is. And what is the work then that you're doing for Epilepsy, Epilepsy Ireland? In 2006, uh, back when they were Brainwave, if anybody knows anything about Epilepsy Ireland, they, they did a name change about 10 years ago. So they used to be called Brainwave back in the day. And they put out a thing in the newspapers 
looking for a patron. They had had a patron. He was a TD. He had since retired and was didn't want to do the job anymore. And they were just looking for somebody who primarily they could point to and go, do you know your man? He has epilepsy. And in 2006, there weren't a lot of people around that fulfilled that, that brief. In fact, there wasn't any. So they did a photo shoot thing, and in the newspapers, there was a big silhouette with a little question mark in the middle, and some of the people from Epilepsy are going, we're looking for somebody who will. And I got in contact with them, entirely presuming they would have 17 people in the queue in front of me. I've always made the joke that, you know, if Brian O'Driscoll, you know, had known someone once who had epilepsy, Brian O'Driscoll would be in front of the queue, they'd go, yes, Mr. O'Driscoll, it's you. You're in. No one else applied but me. So I was, I was, I got the job by default, story of much of my life, I got the job by default. And uh, I've been patron ever since then, and the fir very first thing I did was to appear on Ryan Tuberty's radio show uh, and talk about having epilepsy publicly. Not that I hadn't done it before, but no one had ever asked the question. Like, my friends knew, my family knew, every employer I'd ever had knew, because the first thing I said to everybody was, are you going to hire me just in case you might need to know something? Um, but then I talked about it there, and I kept doing it again and again and again, and any time I'm needed, I come out and talk about it. When we do campaigns during the year, I do that. I occasionally appear on video for them, usually quite nicely. Whenever I'm asked to do something like this or something on TV, usually they would ask about it too. And the whole idea is just to let people know that epilepsy isn't necessarily something that has to completely define the rest of your life. I know for some people it is. It really is. Some people have seizures eight, nine, ten times a day. But that there's an organization there that is there to give you advice, to give you help, to advocate for people. And uh, yeah, they haven't kicked me out yet, which is also quite nice. And every now and then I go, lads, have you got something? You've not kicked me out. Uh, <laughs> okay, good, I'm still here. Yeah, no, no bother. Okay. <laughs> so you're involved in a fundraising venture. Yeah. Uh, Actually, it's tied to the Internet of Lepsy Ireland as well. Yeah, okay. good man. Well, okay. Yeah. Was that a good link? Was that kind of professional That's quality? wildly impressive. Because I'd forgotten I was supposed to talk about that. Good man. Right. So this is the sort of thing to teach in RTE. Yeah. No. I'll, I'll, I'll put my CD in. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us about that. Uh, yeah, I so about six years ago, 2018, um, again, a little bit of a bunch of conversations were, were happening. And I realized I had a bunch of people all in one place. There's about 30,000 people in the book club at this stage. And I thought, if I were to ask them really nicely, I wonder if I set up some sort of Christmas appeal and we all stuck in, like if everybody had stuck in a euro, that was 30 grand for a nice charity somewhere. And not everybody will. But I thought, let's give it a go. First year, we did quite well. I think we did get about 30,000 quid the first year. And over the five years we've run it so far, we've made 190,000 euro over five years for a bunch of different charities, for the likes of the Peter McFerry Trust, for the likes of the DSPCA. We did some for the Samaritans one year as well. And this year, uh, I'm, this year, this year, I've decided to ramp it up, despite the fact that that's a stupid thing to do. And I'm trying to raise funds for four charities this year. So again, the DSPCA, love them. We adopted two dogs off them in 2020. They do amazing work. Um, for the guys in Epilepsy Ireland because weirdly, despite the fact that I'm their patron, I have never made them a beneficiary of this ever. And they did point it out to me, they were like, you know you've done this for five years and you've never... I was like, lads, fair point. So did a bit of that. Uh, the third beneficiary is the first Northern Irish charity we've done, which is Fighting Words NI. Uh, there's a version of Fighting Words in Dublin, Fighting Words NI are the Northern Irish uh, group in Belfast who came from that and they teach kids in mostly working class uh, Protestant and Catholic schools, creative writing, everything from writing their own graphic novels to writing their own plays to write, not in order to turn out the next Sally Rooney, but just because it's something that's good for those kids in and of themselves. Um, I've been on the board there for the last year or so. They're just incredibly lovely people. And then the last ones are my lovely horse rescue, who do just that. They rescue horses all around Leinster and pigs and goats and other lovely animals. And the idea is whatever we make, we'll split four ways between them. And if people would like to contribute, what should they do? Oh, I'd love to. You'd like to contribute, please. It's, it's weird. It goes through sports. So the first few days we did really well. We got a few grand. And then everything went really quiet. And today we made it over the 10 grand mark, which is just amazing. Uh, if you'd like to throw the idea is you throw me the price of a price of a book. If that book costs you two quid, that's great. If you're the sort of person who buys books, it costs you twenty five quid, amazing. Um, you'll find it on any of my socials. Uh, just look me up on Twitter or on Instagram or on Blue Sky these days, or you'll find me on Facebook or anywhere. Or if you need to think about it, it's on GoFundMe. So it's GoFundMe.com/slash/The Ricochet Book Club. 
But if you've had one too many and you're like, I'm not going to remember that, just look me up on any of my social media platforms and you'll find it there. And anything is amazing and it goes towards four amazing charities. And this gentleman is very, very kindly allowed me to sit in front of you. Thank you very much. Well, he, 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 at least he's met us halfway. He didn't just come and ask for a few bob. He did come bearing gifts. I brought presents as well, yes. if, if that helps. And they are books. As you can imagine, in Rick's position, he lives in a huge mansion and it's just adorned with brand new books come from all over the world. People saying, read this and review this and promote this and uh, and don't kick us off your your, your uh, book that, channel. I, sh I should point so, out, this is my huge mansion in Inchcore. That's the, the, you know, the one huge mansion in Inchcore? That's me. Um, <laughs> but you brought some books to yeah. share. Okay, here, like, let's do it this way. Um, I brought a couple of things. This is uh, the former state pathologist, Dr. Mary Casty. This is her novel. She's written a novel. That's her first thriller, that one but there. Before we go any further, who would like a copy of the Mary? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Billy points to his wife, Sarah, so Sarah gets it. Just remember, you're getting the first book now, which means yeah. there could be other better books further along. By the way, the, um, the book of the book was Claire Keegan, um, Small Things Like These. Oh, now we're talking. It was excellent. It's oh, quite yeah. short, so even if like, people don't want to read a really long book, it's quite a short book. Um, I love somebody reviewing a book it. in the middle of my interview. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you all, you all loved it. I wouldn't like it to be longer. Yeah, it no, it was perfect as it was. Yeah. You have to get Sarah on next time, Jerry. I was going to say it. We're now in a situation where we're discussing about why Claire Keegan didn't lengthen her book. <laughs> this is so for anybody who didn't hear at the back of the room, it is Claire Keegan's um, small things like these. Not the current one, which is. Tichy, which is like about eight pages long, but it's the one before that. It is brilliant. You're right. Okay, second Tell book. Tell us about this one. For anybody who's read Solar Bones, Mike McCormick's oh, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is his new book. Oh, okay. uh, I think I think called Beatrice over here would like. Let to me tell you what it is before I give it. Oh, sorry. This is uh, this is called This Plague of Souls by Mike McCormick, and it's kind of a loosely based trilogy with Solar Bones. In the next one along. This probably in the best three books I've read this year. It's amazing. So there you go. That's oh, all yours over there. You. You're welcome. There you go. Uh, from some wonderful Tramp Press. Um, what else have we got? Anybody like George Orwell, 1984? Anybody read 1984? Yeah, okay. Thank this you. is called Juliet by Sandra Newman. It's only just new out on Granta. It is the story of Julia, who is Winston's other half in 1984. But it's the story of Oceania and of 1984 told from the point of view of women who live on Airstrip 1. It's great. It's absolutely fantastic. Who's here? Oh, wait, down the back. All right, hang on. Adrian, wait, down. Down I know I pointed to another Yeah, in the back. Right, okay, let's do that. Here Adrian we go. Adrian was this standing is like, You realise that's wandering as well. Okay, right. Hang on. With us. Yeah, there's more. Okay. Uh, for anybody who saw her either on the Late Late Show or this one, an Irish book award the other night, Katrina O'Sullivan's book, Poor, uh, which is... So, there, look. there you go, right. That's, there you go. So we, we know the next two books that are going to be in this book, so... Uh, this is Disha Bose's Dirty Laundry. This is kind of like a, an Irish thriller murder setting Cork thing. Uh, you're the first hand I saw. You're under a light, so that's yours. <laughs> Over here, right. Over at the very end, there you go. That's, that's good, but just sharing is sharing is caring, something, something. And, and the last one I brought you was uh, the new book from Billy Connolly. It's called Rambling Man, My Life on the Road. Billy Connolly fans, uh, this, is, this is what happens. You know the way you don't like to sit at the front of gigs because you think it's weird. Too late. This is sitting at the... Sitting at the front I, gets you nice things. I, I, it's, it's, very, it's very good of you to come in anyway and talk to us. It's my but pleasure. But it's also very nice of you to come along and take some books out of your own collection. You know, and it's really nice. Believe me, that there's loads here. You are very welcome to those. I really <laughs> enjoy them. And I did join the book club as well to get the chance. It's on Facebook. Just look up the Ricochet Book Club on Facebook, and it's there, and you can do stuff. Yeah, but, but obey the rules, okay? Obey the rules. This, this man is testing. Don't, don't no, live like me, folks. Will you put your hands together, please, for the wonderful Ricochet? Thank you. Good night, Gary. Thanks, man. Thank My pleasure. Believe me.